Hello and welcome to another Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, today's speaker is Josh Atwell uh, talking about disaster recovery. He does an amazing job. It's a great conversation. Uh, as usual, I, I pulled the presentation part to the front of this video and then kept the uh, introduction and chatter pieces to the end of the video um, so that you would get straight to the heart of the matter and then you can listen to our friendly banter if you're interested in uh, light setups and things like that. Enjoy the lunch and learn. If you have more questions, please visit uh, rackn.com uh, slash distance devops and uh, learn more about our agenda. If you want to be a speaker, please, please let me know. Um, we are looking for more people who want to talk briefly about interesting topics related to DevOps. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, just a quick, I'm Josh Atwell, Senior Technology Advocate at Splunk um, and just avid community person, um, particularly uh, around DevOps, data center automation, uh, incident response, those areas. Um, and what, what I'm sharing today is uh, some content that I actually produced for the DevOps Enterprise Summit last year in London. Um, and this, this happened fairly late or fairly last minute, um, and it was a result uh, of an outage that I, I saw a company suffer and as I'm watching the news around this and I'll, I'll tell more about it as we get to that section I had to ask the question like how is the leadership of this company going to like respond uh, internally and externally to this outage and my fear was is that organizations who are moving quickly uh, you know adopting DevOps rapid iteration really differentiating their value in the market with their ability to deliver software if there is a high profile outage, there is, there is a risk that they could undo a lot of work that was in goodwill that was done. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it starts in, in large part because, you know, as Dr. Cook says, you know, large complex systems are always broken, right? People work in that function of, you know, keeping things um, uh, alive, even when they're just doomed and destined to fail. And it's just a matter of time before uh, humans are, are incapable of, uh, you know, identifying a potential issue or um, just simply incapable of uh, preventing, preventing that accident. And so first off, when we think about, you know, outages and, and issues, we have to be mindful that systems are going to fail. Uh, and so it's really important to be uh, very focused on how you're going to respond to that. Also, we now live in a world where outages are, are very different. It used to be that most of the outages we dealt with were very binary, total outages. It's either online or it's offline. Um, now we're, we're very uh, accustomed to having partial outages, maybe we'll have regional outages, uh, particularly as people are perhaps in the, working in the cloud um, and, and distributing their applications. Um, and as we have more applications who are, you know, their functionality is distributed. Um, you know, where there's fewer single points of failure. And then we also deal with service degradation, you know, where the uh, service we're accustomed to or the service levels we're accustomed to, they're, they're not quite delivering there. There's intermittence. Um, and while you may not be getting a 404 error, you know, you're, you're not getting the images. I, I, I remember I, I had an, uh, when uh, AWS S3 had their brown out. I'm using air quotes that you can't see. Um, you know, I was affected by it in an interesting way. I had Sticker Mule was making stickers for me and I had to review the proof, but the proof wouldn't load because it was being stored on S3. The rest of the site worked fine. I could approve it, but I just actually couldn't see it to approve it. So, um, you know, so that was a partial service degradation. Now, when dealing with an outage, and so this outage was Target, and it happened over Father's Day, around Father's Day, um, the weekend prior to Father's Day, and it was all over the news. Like, it was huge. Like, long lines, people abandoning their carts. Um, clearly, this outage had, you know, impact on revenue. It also had impact on confidence, right, both from customers uh, the leadership, obviously, um, was questioning, had questioning confidence in the technology stack that was supported. There, and then there was confidence issues in the market, right? And then, of course, if you worked at Target, like, it was a really 
bad couple of days because they suffered more than one outage that weekend and they weren't exactly related. Um, but they had two outages in a, a very, very big weekend. Okay. And their stock took a hit. So you can see uh, where the red line is. They had a very quick drop there. Now, what's really interesting to note uh, is that, you know, number one, their stock came back, right? There's, you know, that shouldn't be surprising um, because people saw this as an isolated incident. But what's also interesting is the rest of the market was impacted by this outage as well. Walmart took an equal dip in their stock. They didn't suffer any outages, none at all. But there, there is an, a, there, and there is a term for it, and I, I forget what the term is, and I was looking up and I couldn't find it. Um, but there is like industrial empathy, right? They, that if, if one is being faulted, they all, they all suffer just a little bit. And that happened. But what's important so here I is- think, I think the word is sympathetic. It's a sympathetic <laughs> change. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a real thing. Like it, it, it does happen. Um, and so, you know, the stakes are clearly high, but it's possible to recover from a significant outage without having an excessive overreaction. Being in IT, this is what we're accustomed to. You have an out outage, you're like, hold on, whoa, whoa, we've been, we clearly have been going too fast. We're incapable of doing this at the speed that we're going. We have to slow down. And then you'll have some people who are the naysayers. And it's like, oh, I always knew this was too risky and there was no way that we could, we could do this say it safely and successfully. Like, this outage just proves everything. And we all know these people, right? We've worked with these people. They, they exist. Um, you know, they're, they're not able to be quite as vocal as they have in the past. But when you have a high profile outage like that, you, you can feel certain that there's, these people are just, you know, have been chomping at the bit waiting for this situation to happen. But as a leader, you have to avoid these things, right? Because if you react in these types of ways, after all the work that's been done, you're going to further reduce morale. You're going to impact progress that's, in ma that's been made. You're going to have people questioning their competence, their capability, and questioning whether or not what, what's been happening is, um, is worthwhile. And also, you're going to be highlighting that a gross misunderstanding about the risk versus the reward. And I'll touch more on that in a little bit. So you have to ask yourself, how do we restore the lost confidence from all the different groups that I laid out earlier? How can we still maintain our pace of progress, right? Because we need to continue to move forward. And then how can we prepare better for next time? Because as I stated at the beginning, complex systems are going to fail. There's no avoiding that. It's how you prepare for them. Now, when we look directly at, C, at Target, their CEO jump, jumped on and he started talking about his customers first. It's like, hey, we had a tough weekend. It was tough for our brand and it was disappointing for our guests. So he I highlighted that the outage disappointed the, you know, their, their guests. Didn't devastate them, right? Didn't, wasn't necessarily life-threatening or you know, life-altering or ruining. I'm sure some people had a very bad day and were very inconvenienced, right? Um, but you know, he, he acknowledged the, the understanding of the impact. And then also um, inform the market, it's okay, right? Yes, there was a $50 million loss in, one, on, in sales on those days, but um, it was very clear uh, belief that everybody was gonna come back and that the, the losses were probably gonna be uh, minimal. But internally, he also, you know, and we can't speak to what he said specifically to people internally, but we can, um, uh, project what we think he was talking about because publicly he said, you know, within a couple hours, our teams were able to identify the root cause, push the fix and get us back up and running. It was still a disappointing performance overall, but within a couple hours, the team was able to go in, right? So that was good. So that was, you know, starting to, to believe in the process, believe in the people and well, restoring confidence, right? And making people understand that, you know, uh, the organization was able to respond. Um, yeah, you know, it's also important that they believe that he believed in the process of, you know, there's going to be an outage. This is how we're going to respond. This is how we're going to communicate. Okay. Um, also, it's important to keep in mind that when you have failure and as a leader, failure is supposed to make you stronger. Um, I have another talk that I, that I do um, where I talk about how to be a failure. And one of the things I highlight in that talk is that the biodome in the 90s, many of us probably remember the biodome, um, not the Polly Shore movie, but the actual scientific experiment that was the biodome, 
they, they observed that uh, over time, the trees within the biodome were extremely brittle. They were very fragile. It was very easy to break them or to knock them over. And the reason was because they weren't given any resistance, right? So they never developed strength. You know, they, they never had any wind pushing on them or any animals landing on them. They had no resistance. So they never had options to be stronger and it made them brittle. The other component of this was you know, we all recognize that IT and software are driving business value. And when we look at the stock market and as a leader, talking to your board and whatnot, when you look at the market and, and shifts and the impact that happened, because that outage happened right here, right under the, the five year thing, right? There's no way of knowing what direction the stock would have taken over the, the previous um, couple of years since they started implementing, you know, rapid, you know, rapid application development and deployment uh, and, and DevOps. There's no certainty as to what the market would have. What you can look at is what you've accomplished based on the projections you had in the past compared to the realities that you witnessed as a result of issuing that. Uh, many of us probably remember early days of Amazon. You know, Amazon's going to destroy brick and mortar retail. Well, that hasn't been the case. And I think it's reasonable and safe to say that you know, companies like Target and Walmart they, they made a lot of investment and, and were able to implement software on mobile devices and on their website and other areas in order to keep them competitive and improve the user experience. I'm still an avid tar target shopper, love it, right? But there's no way to know what, you know, what impact, okay? Um, and one of the things that I appreciated that was highlighted with this outage is that regardless of this issue, right, Target has been a pioneer of online buying and picking up its store, right? They're early pioneers on that. Um, it's been very successful and it's been, you know, experts across the retail industry has seen it as the model to replicate, right? So as a leader, you have to be mindful of, you know, all of that stuff that led to the outage is also the same thing that was making you a leader and, and a pioneer and really driving your, your business because that added value was in the velocity and not the cost, right? It was the speed of being able to implement the new features and being able to get those to the customers. And it wasn't specifically to the cost of doing that because the reward came in into the velocity. Um, you know, Courtney Kessler has a, has a great statement that she makes where she says it wasn't until they started optimizing for speed and not cost that they started seeing real value in return. Right. And then also it's important to look at, when, when you're looking at these types of scenarios, look at the trends and not a single incident, right? Because the added value um, is very difficult to project, but you, you can very easily see that the, the pace of innovation and release of software and the added value to the customers um, has a direct impact on you know, the success of the organization, the success of the business, right? So, so the net net is, is just because you have an incident, right? And you may have that little dip and that, that, you know, that loss of confidence and that loss of, and those initial concerns and, and worries, you have to look at your long-term, long-term trends. So what you have to focus on then instead is how can we increase stability and maintain speed? Right? How can we keep the train going super fast, but make sure that the rails that the train are riding on are good, that all the, all the um, cargo on the train is balanced well so that the train doesn't sway, you know, that the systems are there to, to, to protect the train and keep it going, going fast. And there's a few ways you can start doing that for adding stability, obviously automating processes, especially when it comes to resolution. Like how do you identify uh, and it's, or you know, how do you get the right people to respond to the incident when the information that they need? How can you increase the visibility and awareness of what's happening in the system? Because again, complex systems, complex systems are going to fail. Um, so you need to increase that visibility so you have better awareness of what's happening. And then practice incident response, right? Since you anticipate and know that failures are going to happen and you're wanting to maintain speed, part of your uh, you know, increase in stability is improving your incident response. Um, using the other two pillars highlighted, 
so that when an issue happens, uh, it, it's very consistent. Um, I'm actually in the process of watch, watching the master class with Commander Hadfield. Um, he you know, was the um, the lead on the International Space Station for a while, and you know, just international sensation, ast sensational astronaut. Um, and one of the things he was talking about in the class I was watching earlier um, was how on the space station, you, you basically have to be a prepared to respond to any uh, traumatic incident within basically a breath, because that's about the time that you have if you have a catastrophic type of incident on the space station. Um, and so they train for these things, and you need to do the same thing for, for your environment. Another thing that Target did well, and I think leaders need to keep in mind going forward, is if you continue to focus on what you're trying to deliver for the customer, it makes it much easier to not overreact when these things happen. Because the velocity of development and the, you know, the increase in complexity and you know, the, the additional complexity and, and the increased likelihood of, of incidents as a result of that increase complexity, and we can debate that one a little bit if we want, but, um, you know, I, I'll argue that's how we, how we respond now is better. Um, you know, your customers aren't going to start wanting less from you simply because you had an outage and had to recover from it. Um, they're going to continue to expect you to grow and develop and deliver more. Um, and so what got you to the place where they want to do business with you today, um, you know, it's, you're going to have to add to that and you're not going to be able to do it by reverting back to the old ways of, of how we were delivering software and managing IT. So three keys here, you know, long term, long term success has to be based on restoring trust first. Right? As you resolve the issue, you want to be able to restore trust both with your customers, the market and your internal people. Um, don't focus on slowing down, but increasing stability, right? Speed is speed is what's getting you where you need to be. Um, how can you make sure that you have stability and, and your response and your response um, is continuing to improve? And that you know any the rewards that you've gotten thus far and the rewards that you're going to, to get in the future are not are are not done without risk, right? You're going to have risk. Things are going to break. Things are going to fail. Um, you know there 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 are going to be moments where people are going to question. Um, but focusing on the customer and focusing on the discipline of, of what got you to where you are is what's going to get you forward. And it can keep you from ha you know, executing a knee-jerk reaction and undoing a lot of great work that was done. And that is it. That is awesome. I have like a page of notes. I was trying to not interrupt you with questions. Oh, you, no, yeah. I was trying to go slow so people could jump in. And, and, uh, looking for hand no, raised. Was, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was so trying to be close. open for I, it. I actually, I actually like going, going all the way through it and uh, hearing all the points because otherwise I, I would have I would have not been able to build. But I wrote down my notes. So if, if other people have a question on the tip of their tongue and they want to jump in, I'll defer. Right. I'm not seeing anybody jumping into unmute. So, um, so I I love this idea of the it's a miracle that it's running, not when it fails, uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. That would what I what I was thinking of is like the entropy law of automation. <laughs> it it's it's not that it's it's you know it's not that it's going to keep running by by itself. It's got to always be propped up from that perspective. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I, I thought I, I liked I liked that as a starting point. I had a, a question. Oh gosh, there's so much. Um, let me start this way. Right, a lot of times the the incidences that you're ta incidents you're talking about are like measured in dollars per minute or dollars per hour that you're down. Mm -hmm. Is there a like a way to say well you know, your your big point was hey you're you're creating reward all the time, you know the the cost of the incidents high but it's you know been enabled somewhere else do you see people have like a cost of no incidents you know days without an accident or a some more balanced way than saying you know we're losing you know 50 million dollars a day if the systems aren't up yeah so i i'll you know i'll preface this by i work for splunk right and so we're, we're a data analytics company and yeah. so you know i'll i'll try to say this without you know, over, over pimping us, I guess is the best way to describe it. Yeah, um, from know, a, so. um, 
But one of the things that we see our customers doing, I, I see our customers do, is as they implement new services and capabilities that are obviously being developed to drive value, there is a target value that you're looking for. Right? There, there is, we're going to implement this feature or this capability with the anticipation that we're going to get this type of additional earnings or this type of additional revenue or whatever metric that, that your, your objective is. Um, I, I see more and more organizations being um, more in tune on, on what those objectives are. Um, you know, of course, then they set up their, their KPIs, you know, to identify like, you know, how do we know whether or not we're hitting it? Uh, for instance, we have one um, uh, food, food chain. Um, I won't list the type of food or, or where they're located or anything like that, but um, they use a combination of uh, mobile app ordering, website ordering, individual call-in storing, coupon utilization, social media uh, information, and you know, they test um, whether certain promotion types work better during the, like the NFL playoffs, right? They will, they will test in markets different types of promotions to see which ones get the best response, and then they'll repeat the most successful ones. Um, and then they, they look at the new features and the new new promotions and the new ways that they're trying to go to market and they, they track how successful they think those are compared to previous similar time periods. Um, and then you know, they do little bits of testing. And so what that does is that gives them a, a better steady state, to your point, a steady state of value delivered right. and, and ongoing value. And you can watch that, right? You can watch that over time. Um, I think we fall victim, and this is one of the reasons why I was concerned and, and originally put this talk together, um, of forgetting what it took to get there, right? Like, um, so for instance, yeah. could you imagine, I'll use Cadoba, which was not the company I was talking about earlier, but uh, I just got an email from them, so they're on top of my mind, mm -hmm. um, plus burritos. Um, but like, could, I couldn't imagine Cadoba, how, difficult yeah. it, you know, right? how, how difficult it would be for me to order from Cadoba right now if it wasn't for the fact that they now have an app that I can go in, I can get my family of fives order, have it saved as a favorite. All I have to do is hit a couple of buttons, hit the payment option. And when I show up, you know, now they have curbside deliver, uh, curbside, you know, takeout. So like they got that integrated into the app. Um, and then, you know, we've got local businesses who are struggling to answer the phone. Uh, because people are calling in and, and wanting to do takeout and they're, they're struggling and, and they're having to result to using things like DoorDash and GrubHub, which is fine, right? Like I'm not, I'm not trying to be disparaging against those because they absolutely serve a, serve a purpose. Um, but I, it's just I, added complexity for them. It's interesting because the point that you drive to that makes me think of process plasticity. Um, because what, what you're saying is, right, if you're not used to having process changes, then you, it's very hard for you to have adopted things. A lot of what you're describing in this case is, as we automate, we, we should be improving plasticity mm -hmm. for um, you know, our, our infrastructure and our systems. If you're not, you know, and that, and sadly, that's not always the true. A lot of times I see people build automation that is not more plastic. It's uh, meaning flexible, right? It actually mm -hmm. makes things more rigid. Oh, I can't do that because if I push this button, then it's going to, you know, start a thousand servers. I can only do mm -hmm. a thousand servers at a time. I can't do one. Um, and so I think some of the error responses that you get are actually from not, not, being good at that incremental change uh, from that perspective. So that I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it quite that way. It's like, oh, if I'm not used to constantly changing my process and taking the risks to doing that and dealing with the fact when something goes wrong, then when I, you know, I try to make a change to a static process and something, you know, it's going to make everybody, um, you know, potentially going to break everything. Yeah, I mean, could you, could you imagine if the pizza companies decided never to adopt the internet or mobile apps. I mean, uh, it, it's crazy. I was, I was talking to my neighbor yesterday and, and this is a great um, juxtaposition here. Um, I, uh, I'll be ordering Papa John's for dinner tonight for my family. Like that's already decided, right? And to do that, I'm gonna get on an app. I'm gonna put everything in. I'll have my special needs and requests for how we want our pizza. 
I will pay for it and it will be delivered to the house. I don't have to call. I don't have to yell at someone <laughs> through the phone, them like mishear what I said, giving them my address and, and like all this other information over the phone, competing with all the noise around them. And, and then from there, I'm going to be able to track every step of my pizza. I'm going to know who's making it when it's, oops, sorry, um, who's, who's making it when they're going to deliver it on the, on the other side of the house. Uh, I ordered a car right before all of this started. Uh, we had a special order for my wife. Uh, she wanted a specific uh, make model with certain color and interior. And um, I love her. She's worth it. So I ordered it. I have no idea where the car is. I don't know when it's going to be delivered. I have I don't know who's building it. I don't know what factory it's coming from. I mean, I can do a little research and figure this. Like it's a black hole, right? Here's a here's an industry where it's a a fifty thousand dollar piece of machinery, and I have no idea when it's going to get here. But a ten dollar pizza I can track from order to to delivery. Um, now, to be fair, Toyota doesn't need to do that for a whole a large number of people, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah comparatively speaking, um, but it is one of those things that it it has an impact on the experience. I, well, I, there's no doubt to me that the strides that the pizza companies have made in automating this and then integrating all those pieces together are setting the bar for a lot of other people, just like the early uh, sure. cloud companies, right? The Netflix has changed, you know, move, move the, move the window of what is acceptable technology further. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then, you know, then they get very good at, you know, being able to be change resilient and handling handling things like this what what do you think from a messaging and communication style on these incidents because there is this element of you know a whole bunch of people at the trough wanting information about how things are going um <laughs> and yeah. you don't want to you don't want to have the people solving the problem distracted with status updates and at the same time no no information is a bad thing what's how do you help people with the balance um, yeah, so the, I mean, the, the key there is having, having people who are, are focused on uh, managing the response. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, so I'm actually working on a paper right now as part of the DevOps Enterprise Forum, um, part of uh, the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, and the paper we're actually writing is on uh, a, an assessment mechanism for incident response. And some of the advice that's going to be coming through on that paper is, you know, that it's important that you have a regular cadence and an understood cadence of uh, communication on, you know, what actions are being taken, um, what's the current state, um, what are the needs of the people that are working the activity, um, when the next update is going to be. Right. And, and so that you're not, you're not running the incident interrupt driven um, and then providing enough information so that reporting across different, um, uh, different layers, if you will, is there. Um, you don't want to have what happened with what was it, British Airlines who had a significant power outage, I think it was, and they blamed a single individual. It's like, you know, this person's been sacked and it was all their fault. And it's like, well, um, okay, I'd really be interested in the incident response um, uh, to that because I anticipate it was a very top down, heavy handed, well, the senior executive VP of whatnot, of wherever. And, you know, I'm not trying to pick on, you know, British Airways. Um, but you know that's that's we, saw, I, that's we we saw that at Equifax. You can pick on them all you want. Okay, um, but the, <laughs> the the point of it, yeah, the the point there is is that um, it, it it wasn't a response focused on customers. It was a, it was a response focused mm -hmm. on you know I'm I'm unhappy with this. You're incompetent, and it's all your fault. And this is why I don't invest in IT and like a very antiquated view of IT and technology being a cost center and a, a required evil versus um, a, a driver of business value, customer value, and, and uh, you know, driving the business. I, I think there's an even more pernicious uh, human factor in what you just described, which is that if, 
you know, all incidences are system incidents, right? That's, that's usually where yeah. I start I, my starting point for this, right? It's, mm -hmm. I, you know, systems thinking gold rat type stuff. But if you end up blaming and firing a person for a, a, a systems problem, then you have just told everybody in your organization that, yep. <laughs> that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be held responsible for any change that gets made. And all of a sudden you're, they're going to stop taking risks. They're going to stop making changes. They're going to basically. Well, then you have a, a complicated cab system. Yep. Cab? Uh, the change board. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Then, well, in some cases, change boards end up existing as CYA. Yep. Um, right. And I've watched this happen in big organizations. It's, you know, nobody's actually empowered to make a real decision. And so they just pass things up until an executive says no. Um, because the only point of a cab board is ultimately to say no, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm being skeptical for that, but um, you know, that's, that is what very much what happens, right? It's like, I don't want to sign off on that risk, pass it up the chain until you yeah. get to somebody who can't get fired for saying yes, or they just say no. Um, Change, change accountability board. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, so there's a there's a good uh, for for listeners who uh, or, or you know attending and listening later. There's a great book on this. It's called Beyond Blame by Davis Wybeck. Hmm. Uh, it's it's just it's short. It's fairly short. Uh, we'll go novella, um, but it it's exactly that. Like it, it talks about a significant network outage at a um, high paced financial firm. And, you know, um, somebody said somebody's head had to roll. And so the person who was executing the change, that was the person. And there was a, it was a culture of, of blame and, and misguided accountability. Um, yeah. It's a great, it's a great read. Um, I highly recommend it to everybody. That's a good, these are, these are things that people really need to think through as you're building the systems, right? Cause mm -hmm. you know, they will fail. I like that you started with that, right? It's it's not a question of, of if, it's you're building something that's complex enough, especially with microservices stuff, it's all chained together. You know, you're gonna get a, a butterfly effect and something's gonna break. Yeah, and it's, it's also in designing the systems and, and how they fail. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you some good examples of um, good and bad. Uh, early routers used to fail open <laughs> like, ah, right. mm -hmm. like firewalls would fail open. Like, no, that's terrible. <laughs> He's just letting <laughs> stuff through the shit. And um, so then they then they made it to where they they failed closed, which is better, um, but still problematic. Uh, so I I did home automation with lighting and stuff in my house, and there was a period of time where hue lights, if the power went out, as soon as the power came back on, every hue light you own would come on full brightness. <laughs> <laughs> Bright white, full brightness. Uh, whenever the power was restored, and, and so, and you know that is not a good failure mode, right? That is not a good way to recover from failure. Uh, and so they they made improvements to that. It's still not where I'd like it to be, but it's amazing how much of that stuff is actually just test patterns that ended up embedded in systems, right? It's yeah. You know, oh, I have to test this system. I'm the one turning it on with a clean clean system all the time, so I want this behavior from a test perspective. Um, I see that all the time in, in starting up systems. You, you see the test pattern as the first pattern, not, not the use pattern. Mm -hmm. ay, ay, ay. All right, we are just about at the top of the hour. We're starting to lose people too. Um, Josh, this was great. I, I really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I make the joke uh, that you know, I think about and talk about failure a lot which I know everybody understands makes me really popular at parties. Um, but, but the truth is, is like failure is a, is a you know, big thing that we have to deal with. And I want to continue to see people uh, respond to it intelligently and, and you know, with, with informed decisions and you know, very measured responses versus what we've been accustomed to. Um, we, we definitely need that transition. I, I, wish, I wish we celebrated it better because then Agreed. we would learn from it for other people. We'd be able to talk through what we did. And yep. We're not, we're not very good at that at all. So cool. 
All right. Well, thank you. This was this was great. Um, I don't have the. Uh, oh, I think Eric Wright is our next is is next on the he schedule. Is. So it was a terraform, I think. It can be terraform, and I got some Lumi people to talk about uh, Lumi and infrastructures code. We have great people. If you think of other people who want to join, or talk for you know fifteen, I guess we're doing a little bit longer <laughs> in a regular time, which is fine. Uh, just let us know. All right, cool. everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Good evening. Thanks. They're getting a please wait. The webinar will begin soon. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah, let me do that. Now we're broadcasting to all attendees. Perfect. Oh, that's cool. I can, I can, uh, allow people to talk without promoting them to panelists. Neat. Which is uh, useful. That's a new feature. I like it. Then uh, that works really nicely. All right. Well, everybody, we just started. Uh, Sorry for forgetting to open up the panel, uh, but we just started. Uh, Josh and I were we're having a conversation about recording recording lights and on air lights, which reminds me with background noise. I'm going to close my door. Do you want to tell them about your setup? I thought it was that's sure. Repeating. Uh, yeah. So at my home, I uh, I was fortunate enough to build. Uh, or get involved very early on in the building process and as such able to provide some instruction to the electrician on some additional things that we wanted and I had a bunch of outlets uh, electrical outlets placed near the ceiling uh, on walls in, in each room and um, that really perplexed <laughs> the electrician but they were for IP cameras so to watch the kids as they were little um, most of those cameras are down now because we don't we don't need them because we've gotten older. Um, but the other thing I had installed was the uh, on-air light. Uh, I had a sconce put on the wall downstairs uh, so that I could flip a switch upstairs to let everybody know I was on a call that was maybe for a customer or recording. And they could not bother me or potentially be quieter. So it's been useful as we've had everybody at home for the last few couple months now. It's nice if you have a segmented part of the house. Like for, for me, people wander by the, the yeah. office and so if they're still loud, they're still loud. So they don't, they don't think to um, do it. And then the major source of noise for me is the dog who doesn't care about the color of the lights. At all. Right. <laughs> I, I did have, uh, we have um, some translucent granite for a bathroom. And then I had a similar experience with an electrician because they, uh, I had them install uh, switched outlets underneath the counters, yep. or underneath the sinks. And they're like, that's not, why would you do that? And uh, they came back at when it was all together and, and realized that it was a, what I'd done. But. Yeah, we, we did similar for, uh, you know, charging our, um, like my beard trimmer and the toothbrushes and stuff like mm. that. Same, same deal. Oh, that's yeah, put it in. I think I put it. those under, yeah. Yep, have moment. I have my I'm moments. Have not switched. I, I like it. I like it a lot. What I really wish is that we had more ubiquitous USB power and plug type of thing instead of converting outlets to USB. It'd be nice just to have uh, strategic USB ports. Yeah, I've I've been on the fence about doing that in large part because the USB ports in sock like in the. Uh, in the outlet, uh, I've always been dubious about their surge protection capabilities. Mm. And I'm not speaking at a, of, a, of an authoritative nature that I know for a fact of that you know they do or do not. Um, I've just been suspect. I mean, the bigger issue to me is just replacement. It seems like USB uh, supplies aren't that don't have that much longevity, um, and so it's you know. It's not necessarily useful. I mean, definitely the ones in the airports. Right. <laughs> it's like, what, what do they do? Like, they, they use, like, 
much worse USB ports because the airport ones are are dangerous in themselves, but then uh, completely uh, wasted. Well, yeah, they 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 definitely suffer from significant wear and tear. Yeah, that should be like the testing ground for any USB port design. Yeah, can you survive a week at uh, MSP? <laughs> Oh, that's that and the outlets too. I mean, they're the outlets are about as weak as as you can get from that perspective. Very sad. How is everybody? Welcome to the lunch learn. Let's say uh, everybody who's in should be unmuted. If you're not, uh, give me a shout out, and I can allow you. Know, you have the power to mute or unmute. Um, Hi there, it's Sherry. Hello. Real, do you want a real answer to that question? Uh, <laughs> I, yes, a real answer would be fine. Sherry's fine, except she has shingles. Oh, oh. shoot. Yeah. So there's your, there's your happy. <laughs> All, right. All right. Actually, shingles is one of those examples we give when we talk to the kids about, you know, being cavalier about COVID. And we're like, yeah, yeah you never know, you know, 20, 30 years from now. What 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 the long term is? Yep. Some of these things. So get the shingle shot if you uh, in, well if you're old enough to get it. <laughs> I'm 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 just yeah I, I I didn't get it or I I don't know if I'm not quite old enough to get it. I can't remember but luckily it's only it's only in one spot and it's on my forehead so it looks like Molly hit me in the head with a giant golf ball but. Oh, no. Hopefully, hopefully that's all I get. I mean, unless I've heard horror stories of, you know, people having it all over and their backs. And so, yeah. So. Well, I wish you well with that. Yeah. It does not sound um, ideal. No, but listen, it could be a lot worse. So I count myself lucky. Once you start having symptoms, is it too late to get the shot? I don't. No, um, they do say to get it if even if you've already gotten it. Um, I was put on um, a medication right away. It's funny because I went to the ER because I had the. I, I actually thought it was something. I thought it was cellulitis. I have an old nursing degree, so I thought it was something else. And um, the doctor thought it was just a fungal infection. And I was the next day, and I was like, I don't agree with him. I did what he told me to do. And then I called my family doc who, who I, I sent pictures to, and he was like, that's not a fungal infection. So um, we, he's like, no, I, I think, I think you've got shingles. I had ruled out shingles just because it was only in one spot, but he's like, no, you can get shingles in one spot. And I'm like, okie dokie. So um, they put me on medication right away. So hopefully that will at least shorten the, the, the duration at least. So, yeah. But it is bloody painful. Holy crap! Ouch. And not only that, because it's my forehead, you, you don't you start to realize how much you move your your brow all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I completely appreciate that one, Sherry. I had to have a um, uh, section cut out of my forehead um, due to excessive sun exposure throughout my life, and mm -hmm. um, they were like, "All right, well, you know, just." Uh, you know, keep it keep it dry and um you know avoid what do they say um uh, uh, intense scowling i think is the way they, she described it <laughs> and i'm like yeah no 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 problem but they didn't tell me is that laughing was equally uncomfortable okay yeah you you really don't realize it uh until you know cuz now every time i move my face or my head or you know? Is laugh or whatever it's like a new a new experience in pain and or so between that and the itching but that's uh, uh so that that was that's been my my week how are you guys <laughs> <laughs> better than that I, oh, I, good. I think um you know we're trundling through i'm finding that it's I've, i'm stopping for the day a lot more than i used to so like i get to a certain point and then i i walk away from my desk is good you go back <laughs> later on uh sometimes i do sometimes yeah. i don't um and the you know there's always there's i it's, i'm never like far away from the, my desk if you want to think about it that way yeah but um but not try you know not sitting down for two hours or so to work yep 
like a medieval that kind of view. But that's the problem, right? There's, there's always something to do. At least with me, it's always like, oh, there's another job I could try and go and find and apply for. And that's that was with with startup life for me is that you get to a re you reach a point and you're like, I there's always there's so, things are dropping on the floor no matter what I do. So it's the way things go. So that, that reminds me of uh, one of the things that I, I coach people on is, uh, you know, we, we have so many things in our lives and it's really pertinent today, I think as well. We have so many various things that we must juggle in our lives and those priorities shift, obviously. Um, so the, the best thing that uh, I coach on is identify whether the things you're juggling um, bounce, shatter, or just drop with a thud. Um, things that shatter, like your relationships, um, you know, your your health and your mental health, and uh, you know, the things that are difficult to repair, if if able to repair at all. You know, you got to be mindful of those always. Um, a lot of things can bounce to the ground and come right back up to you, um, you know, with little effort. And then you have things that if you drop them, it's difficult to continue juggling everything to pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes practice or skill or, or extra effort or will. Um, and so it's, you, know, you, you categorize the things that you juggle accordingly and then it makes it really easy to, or relatively easy to identify how much you can juggle at any given time. Yeah, that's a really good point. That and along with uh, Rob's tweet, I think earlier this week about coaching praise openly or praise publicly yeah yeah uh, mm -hmm. coach. yeah uh, and i've always lived by that um i'm a big believer in 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 in, in coaching and uh and feedback so yeah that's an important oh my god it's such a hard thing though i know but I, I, I will say this about, I've, I've always, I even, one of the things I do when I'm doing my reviews with my team or what I've always done is ask for feedback for them, for me, like, you know, no holds barred. Mm -hmm. um, tell me what I need to do to, to, for you, you know, what am I doing good? What am I doing bad? What am I not doing enough of, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, and I've always asked for that because, you know, how do I know otherwise? Um, if I'm, if I'm do I, you know, I, I might think I'm doing a great job, but you know, you might feel like I don't give you enough time, you know, or, yeah. uh, and in my roles, like, I think like the two of you as well have always been like multi verticals where I'm literally doing the job of three people. So giving time to any one thing properly is always a challenge for me. I, yeah. You have to give yourself permission. Um, the, the big, the big danger I, and then we can transition into the Josh's actual talk because some of this ties into that really well. Is not letting uh, the whirling dervish effect make you mediocre at a whole bunch of stuff, right? To to not to not fight fire so much that you're um, you know leaving a whole bunch of of things smoldering at mm -hmm. the time to put things out. Um, and I actually have a, I try to have a very, a lot of discipline. If I'm in a room where we're having a discussion with a meeting and we can say, this is a closed issue <laughs> we have decided, or this is the, to be very, I did that this morning with, with, uh, we we're having a conversation about, uh, it doesn't matter what, but I got to a point, I'm like, let me be very clear. We have a, we've made a decision. It's this, we don't, you know, we're not going to drag this on. You know, we can close that, go. Well, we had the people, I'm like, we're done because mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to not um, indicate to a group that you resolve something. I, I find this like, and then people keep coming back to it or they don't think a decision was made. So I always try to be like, all right, you're making a decision. This is the decision, write it down, move on. Um, so I do find it in, in our world a bit, sometimes it's really difficult to do that just because of the nature of the of the, the systems that, you know, it's easier on my project management side, I would say, because like we've made a decision, we're going to do this, but because I find on the DevOps side, some things are just off, often um, uh, living, breathing systems that, you know, mm -hmm. that keep either growing or sometimes I find it difficult to squash the, that or, or, um, or maybe it's a matter of defining 
it differently later on mm. and speaking out loud. Maybe that's a better way of going about it. Josh, were you going to comment? Well, I was, I was agreeing. Yeah, I like it. My part of part of what I try to do for that is um, I keep unmuting, allowing people to talk from the attendee side. The um, I, I will put together a time frame for reevaluation for some things, and oh. DevOps is always like that. It's like, all right, we're doing this. We'll check in on a month in a month to see if it's right, but we have to make a decision. We have to execute. Um, I sometimes have the opposite problem where I'm like laying out solutions and I say that in a definitively enough way my, my tone of voice is wrong and people assume that I'm like stating an opinion when I'm just stating like what ifs right um, and that that can cause meetings to go off the rails because I'm like ah, you know I think we should do this or and hmm. I, instead of we could I guess I'm trying to say we could do this and I'm presenting it as a we should amazing how big of a difference that. Won't someone rid me of this pesky priest. 